creature after creature after creature and tricking them and getting their food. But what Anansi didn't know is that there was one creature that had been watching him all the time. It was the little bush deer. She had seen everything that Anansi had done. And she knew that Anansi was coming to her place next. What do deer like to eat? Berries, very good. And deer, little bush deer, being a very holistic kind of type of deer, had the finest organic berries only, always. Well, bush deer was sitting on her porch when Anansi came and said, Oh, bush deer, bush deer, uh, uh, it's so hot. Come on, take a nice walk with me through the woods. And bush deer said, Okay. And she went prancing through the woods with Anansi until they got to that spot. And Anansi said, oh, Bush Deer, look at that, look at it, what's that? And Bush Deer said, what's what? That right there. What right where? This, this, what, what? That thing, that thing, what thing, what thing? Can't you see it, see what? This, 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 this. what, what, what? The strange looking must go to rock. And it was too late. The rock jumped up, went right between the other two knots, bam. And Bush, Anansi went, doing. Bush deer ran to all the other creatures. She told them all what had happened. They all marched over to Anansi's house and got all of their. And then when Anansi woke up, he had how many knots on his head? And a triple size, et cetera, headache. And when he went home, all the food that he had stolen was. And that's the story of Anansi and the moss-covered rock. Because this story is about a man who starts off, the, the heart of the story starts off when he's eight years old. This story I call Flight Time. Now, Eugene Jacques Bullard was born in Georgia in 1894. Is that a long time ago? Yeah. Oh yeah, 1894. And in Georgia in 1894, it was very, very hard on black people in Georgia in 1894 because there was this thing, racism. There were these organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and it was very, very hard. Eugene lived in Georgia with his father and his brothers and sisters. There were about 10 of them. And they were being raised by their father. His mother had died when he was very young. And his father was from an island called Martinique. And he used to tell his children, one day you must go to France. Because in France, blacks are not treated like in this country. So one day you must go to France. Now Eugene saw his father go through a lot of hardships. And at the age of eight years old, he decided to heed his father's words. Now, parents, we all want our children to listen to what we say, right? But I don't know if Eugene's father meant for him to take him so seriously so soon. At the age of eight years old, he decided to go to France. He had a little pet goat. He sold that goat for a dollar and 50 cent, took that dollar and 50 cent, and headed for France. Do you think it was easy for him to get to France? He didn't even really know where France was. He just knew he had to get to the coast to a ship and go across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, it would take him four years just to get to a port where there was a ship. He had all kinds of adventures. Sometimes he stayed with gypsies who were from Europe and they treated him very well and they said, we're going back to Europe in two years. Stay with us. We'll take you to France. But at eight years old, two years seems like an eternity. If he had known, he would have stayed. At one point, he was kidnapped. He was kidnapped by this white family who treated him like a slave. They kept him for about eight months or so before letting him go. Finally, he made it to the coast where there were ships. And there was a ship that was going to a country called Germany. He had never heard of Germany, but he found out it was in Europe. He said, okay. He started hanging out. 
with the crew. He found out they were from a place called Hamburg, Germany. He had never heard of Hamburg, Germany. He thought they were going for hamburgers. <laughs> well, he became friends with some of the crew. He got to run errands on and off the ship. And he found himself a place to hide. He found out when that ship was going to leave. And he got on that ship the night before it left. He had some water and some food with him. He thought it would be enough, but it wasn't. So he got in his hiding place. And after about two days, all the food he had and the water he had was gone. Yes. So he was hungry. And his stomach was going Feed me. Finally, he couldn't take it anymore. He got out of his hiding place. He marched over to the cafeteria and got in line for food. And they looked at him and they said, Eugene, what are you doing here? And he told them what he was going to do. Well, they said, we've got to take you to the captain because he had stowed away on the ship. And captains weren't generally happy about that. So they took him to the captain. The captain knew Eugene, and he liked Eugene, but he wanted to put some fear into him. You stowed away on my ship, he said. I should throw you overboard and feed you to the fish. Eugene looked at the captain and said, them fish don't need no food. I do. I'm hungry. And the captain laughed and laughed and laughed, got Eugene some food, and gave Eugene some work to do. And for the next two weeks, Eugene worked on that ship. The ship landed in Scotland. Eugene got off, and the captain paid him for the work that he did. Then he did all kinds of odd jobs working his way down towards London. At one point before getting to London, he worked in a gym. And in the gym, there were people who were training to, to box. That's right, prize fighters. And he was helping them in their training. And one day, one of the boxers said to him, Eugene, would you like to be a boxer? He said, yeah, I want to be a boxer like Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight world champion. So he learned to box, and he started fighting. He went all the way to London, and he won his fights. And then one day they said, Eugene, we've got a fight for you. And guess where that fight was? In France. It had taken Eugene 11 years to get to France. He won his fight. Then he moved to France, he joined the Foreign Legion when World War I broke out, and he got many decorations and many medals. But he couldn't be a grunt, a foot soldier anymore because of some of his wounds. But they said, Eugene, you can do anything else you want to do in the military. He decided he wanted to be a pilot. So Eugene Jock Bullard, in 1917, became the first African-American military pilot. After the war, he settled in France. He opened up a jazz club. He, he became a drummer, had his jazz band. He opened up a jazz club. And before World War II, the Nazis came, and some of them would come to his club. And they would wait till everybody else had left, and they would talk about their plans to invade France. Because Eugene would be the only one there. And they thought very little of black people. But Eugene spoke fluent German. And he became a spy for the Allies. And when World War II started, he fought again. He, received, he would receive more medals. But he had to leave France when Germany occupied it, moved back to New York. He would never see his parents, his father, or his siblings again. But after World War II, he got more awards. Some of you all might remember Maurice Chevalier, who was a very famous French actor who was a friend of Eugene's who came for the presentation of one of those awards. And Eugene lived to be, I think, around 60-something, uh, no, no, oh yeah, 60, almost 70 years old. And that's the story of Eugene Jock Bullard and Flight Time. And that's the end of that. All right. When I was a boy, my mama told me I could be anything I wanted to be. Reading to her mind was the key to make my dreams reality. She said, as long as I kept my head in the book 
It didn't matter what direction life took. More than beauty, wealth, and fame, knowledge is the key to the power game. My mama gave me knowledge that I would need, and in my mind she planted a seed. She nurtured that seed with a mother's love and prayers for guidance from the powers above. As I grew to be a man, there were times in my life full of hardship. I'm talking buku strife. But in those times of difficulty, I never forgot the things that my mama told me. There was a time a few years ago I was confused about where my life would go. Around this time, I just found out what storytelling was all about. I heard stories from Bernina Stram and Joel Ben and Sybil Dustin, Ella Reno, and Leslie Perry. Listen to these folks inspired me. I said, a storyteller is what I'm going to be, because I can be a telling tale. Since you off like a rocket, now I'm living by my motto. Have mouth, we'll run it. Hopes it'll tell inspires you to make a go with something you really want to do. Thanks for listening. It's been slamming. We've been getting down. We've been jamming. Hey. And that's the end of that. Thank you all very, very much. Woohoo! You've been a great audience. Parents, I salute you all. <laughs>